all the time I meet people who say, I've got a very good beginning, but I haven't yet got the end. They're wrong. They haven't got a good beginning. So let's begin in the way that we intend to do by asking each of our speakers to set out their view about whether we really do want more structure in life or less structure in art, and should they reflect each other, or do we actually want to see structure in art when there is none in life? So, Jana, could I begin with you and your thoughts? Uh, yes. Um... I think basically life is chaotic. Uh, and yes, we use all these various events to um, create some kind of structure. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think events and traditions, it gives us a structure to deal with our emotions, our reactions. For example, burial rituals um, is a way to deal with grief or, uh, when you meet death. Um, Christianing or name giving of children is a way uh, to celebrate a child. And I'd, I think those are important ways to mark changes and transitions in our lives. Um, I think it is not an invention, but a reality that only after the end, only after death, can our story really be told? We don't know who anybody really is, or the essence of somebody's life, until we know when and how they died, who they were when they died. Because some people regret half their life stories, or even their entire life stories and values, just before dying. And that does change how we would see them. That's why it's important, for example, why you know, I'm totally against the death sentence, but what it is interesting, you let people say something just before they're executed because it is important, do they regret their actions or not? You know, even though I hate the setup, but there's an, a philosophical element to that. And um, the same then goes into fiction. As a novel writer, yeah, it would be great if I could just, you know, write a bit, laugh, write, and go off. But it would be very uninteresting for others. It would be a little bit like having a conversation with no threat. Um, yes, we do jump from one issue to another when we speak to each other. Yet, if it shall be an interesting conversation, there has to be some kind of... Um, line in the conversation that leads to a conclusion. Anecdotes are fun for a little while, but you want them to add up to something. And there can be novels with no real ending that are worth reading, like Gogol's The Dead Soul of Kafka's The Castle. So our novels that petered out or in the, in the narrative sense, because the writers didn't have the time or opportunity to finish them tightly, and they're still absolutely worth reading. Um, but I think that's because in most narratives, there's an arch. You start building that arch from the first page, and it only works if, if it somehow follows a structure. That's, it's laid out generally in the first three sentences. You can no longer change that arch if you don't get it right from the beginning. Uh, and then, you can almost see where it will go. It's going high and then low dramatically. It's a long thing. But the ha it has to follow that for us to feel it. I think, though I cannot prove that, but like music has a mathematical structure in terms of harmony, uh, which if it breaks, it becomes like this harmonic for us to listen to. I do think dramatic structure has the same, that we know with the pitch in our stomach, what works dramatically and what doesn't. And that somehow has to be part of a narrative to hold our attention. It can be done many different ways, but it's that kind of, of yeah, mathematical, can you say, function has to be there. Um, yes, you can do loads of other things that can be fun for a moment, but the narrative is important. And I think, actually, it doesn't matter if it ends with a whimper or a bang, because it depends how you define that. A whimper can also be 
could be considered a sexual kind of thing. That's a different kind of ending, but we do need to know what the ending is to understand the entire story that has been told us, whether through a life, a theater play, or a novel, or which way. That's my... Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in what you say, because um, Wittgenstein, when he was talking about Freud, instead of just criticizing the view of positing unconscious thoughts and desires, he said, Freud got things wrong when he talked about dreams. He always tried to find an episode in life that explained why the dream happened. And, and Wittgenstein says, that's not what we want. What we want to know is how the dream ends when we wake up. So we're, we're, we're craving that narrative structure, it seems, even, even in our waking moments. David, can I come to you next? Yeah, well, thoughts? this question has been answered by the invention of a new art form in the 21st century, and it's called long-form television. <laughs> and um, the hope of long-form television was that it was going to be like a 19th century novel and that actually you would get to know the characters and every week your knowledge of the characters would deepen. And that it, as this process went on, the work would become richer and richer. Now, I don't know about you, but I have given up watching at least four long-form series, television series, because they're all so boring, because they endlessly reiterate the same question. Line of Duty began magnificently, very fascinating. It invented a new kind of interrogation scene. And then by the first time they did it, great. The second time they did it, less great. The third time they get it, you're screaming to get out of the room. I don't care who H is. I don't think the author knows who H is. He's just stringing it along because the idea is meant to be that this series is meant to go on forever and that a lot of people watch. And so the BBC controllers are saying, can you please string this out? And that is what essentially long-form television is. It's stringing out ideas that go on and on and on. The other ones I've stopped watching are The Crown. I got the idea, soap opera, royal family, got it, okay. <laughs> One series is enough to knock that idea on the head. You don't need to watch any more of that. Ozark, the family are apparently middle-class bourgeois people, but they're also psychopaths and they kill. Okay, I got it, I got it. <laughs> I got it after two series, I got it after three series, after four series, again, I'm screaming, it's enough. The same ideas are being endlessly rotated. Succession began, brilliantly original, you know, it's very, very witty. It's got some of the best writing on television. However, how many times can Brian Cox tell somebody to fuck off? If he does it again, I can't stand it. Please stop, you know? And also, I don't believe it. I don't believe there is anybody like Logan Roy who goes around and puts their face approximately three inches from somebody else's face and shouts, fuck off. I just, I just don't know anyone who does that. Maybe you in your richer lives have met people like that. <laughs> I haven't met anyone like that. I'm bored with succession and it's dwindling. And so you think of even the greatest television series and the ones that I'm fondest of, in other words, I'm a, I was a fan of Mad Men. I was a tremendous fan of High Mat, which is the German series Homeland, which is one of the greatest television series made. But even the greatest fan of those series would say, that the end does not have the same intensity as the beginning because they were spun out for so long. The only exception to the rule, you might argue, is The Sopranos, the only one that works like a 19th century novel and goes on endlessly reinventing the characters and finding more richness in the characters over, I believe it's over 100 hours, isn't it? Um, that I do believe. But most people during these series are screaming for an ending. They want an ending because they want a sense of conclusion. Now, I'm asked to do a lot of literary novels and adapt literary novels, and the first thing I ask is, what is the ending going to be? Because by and large, people who go to the cinema leave the cinema remembering the ending, not remembering the beginning. All films begin well. I've barely seen a film that doesn't begin well. The first half hour is always entertaining. The second hour is usually a little less entertaining. And then by the last part, you're again going, oh my goodness. And so all I ask when I'm given a book is, does this have a good ending? And the only choice about the ending that I like is please let it not be binary. In other words, I am not, I don't want to adapt any book in which the question is, will she marry him or won't she? Will, will the guy get the job or won't he? 
will the wave wipe out the town or will the town avoid the wave? If there anything which has a binary, a moment in the road at which there are two choices, is something that I am in trying to avoid at all possible costs because it is untrue to most human experience that such things happen. And anyway, those, audio, those binary films in which he either does or doesn't get the girl, or the girl does or doesn't get the job, piss half the audience off because they want the other thing from the, from the half. The most famous ending in history, which we all know as film fans, is Casablanca. Casablanca is an improvised ending where Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman and Conrad Veidt had no idea which way it was going to end. So it had a binary ending, and they discussed at great length how it would go. And then they invented the most magnificent cheat in film history, which is a speech in which Humphrey Bogart has to say, anyone can see that the problems of two people don't add up to a hill of beans in this crazy world. In other words, those of you who've been watching this film for the last hour and a quarter, a hour and a half, and wondering about whether Ingrid Bergen is going to end up with me or Conrad Veidt, it doesn't matter. You shouldn't, have, you shouldn't have worried about this in the first place. Now, that is a magnificent solution to the binary problem, but having said that, it is also a magnificent cheat. And it's only because it's so incredibly well written that people don't notice that it is a cheat. So endings are... Well, I'm going to quote... Sandy McKendrick, because Alexander McKendrick was not only the great film director who made Sweet Smell of Success and therefore is one of the greatest directors who ever lived, he was also the pioneer of film teaching. And he said the most profound thing about endings of anyone I know, and it was one of his rules for screenwriters. And he said, all the time I meet people who say, I've got a very good beginning, but I haven't yet got the end. He said, they're wrong they haven't got a good beginning. Thank you. John, what a, you're a very hard act to follow, David. I feel really <laughs> but, we're but we're going now. to invite you to do it nonetheless, so please. <laughs> That's what I say. Have you seen Shameless? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm amazed how much of this television you've watched, because I, I don't have the time. I, I can't find the time, but I'm, I'm going to speak from the position of a documentarian as a documentary filmmaker because of course you know you're going into the field of the world of people's lives of situations where you 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 know that what you the footage that you create is not going to be the end there isn't an end you know so you've got to find a way to make make an ending in a situation that's ongoing so i am i when i there is a sense of filming and you say, well, that I forgot, I've got an end now. Now I can actually make the film. And, and that is the truth of it, because I mean, the end is, is it's got to happen. And it's, the end is a fascinating metaphor as well. It's more than just the end of the film. And one of the things I was gonna, thinking about uh, is like War and Peace, and the moment when Prince Andre lies on the ground and he thinks he's dead, or we think he's dead, and it's, it's almost, the, be the end is almost somewhere in the, in the beginning. It's planted, it's an extraordinary moment. So, you know, endings do kind of echo, echo death in many ways. Um, and so they are crucial. Um, and then, you know, in terms of, you know, talk, I was thinking about endings that I'd enjoyed. Um, and in documentaries, and I don't know if any, anyone saw Frederick Wiseman's film about the New York Public Library called Ex Libris. He has a beautifully crafted ending, which is very subtle, but really has this kind of pulsating question at the end of it. And it's that, what you, picking up on what you said about death, it's, it's so true that the death of a person makes their life clear in a way that doesn't seem to, the, the, the story of the life doesn't fall into place until there is the death. So I, as a documentarian, are trying to just, I don't, I see myself as creating a document in a certain moment of a life, Grace Jones's life, um, and it's going to go on, or, you know, the, the world of the films is, gonna, is going to go on, and what's that, where does that sit? It's a question for me, it's quite an interesting one. Yeah. Where will this moment of documentation sit within that world or that life? 
So, yeah, endings do preoccupy those of us who work in making films, music to, you know, theatre. They're, they're crucial. So I don't want to, I want the, the conversation to go on. I don't want to start speaking in banalities. So, I, please. This, this is really helpful uh, to sort of set out some of the pieces that we need to explore. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in the fact that, Jan, and it surprised me, you have a very sort of Greek conception, you know, of the life that the life is estimated at the end of the life, that you can only then evaluate, not, not in the middle, not before, and, and you know, call no man happy till he's dead. That's the idea that we, we get the whole thing. And yet, and yet, um, I'm thinking of Chekhov's short stories where nothing much happens. You, you, there's a, a long, dry path. There are some cherry trees. There's, there's, there's a woman in a rocking chair. She's looking down the road. Maybe someone will come. A few things happen, and nothing much happens, and it ends. But somehow you know exactly how their lives are going to be, how they've always been and how they're going to be. So in some sense, you don't even need an ending. You need the sense of the life suggested by a slice of it, maybe. And I wonder whether, if we can talk about uh, documentary making, it's not necessarily about ending the subject, but it's framing it in some way yeah. that allows us to go on dwelling on it, thinking yes. about it, moving with it somewhere. Yes. So, so maybe an ending doesn't have to be a dramatic ending like the whole of the life. Maybe yes. you can think of, how do I put artificial boundaries around this topic that yes. satisfy us as viewers? Something like that? Yes, I think you know, you, you, you're setting up a series of questions. You're engaging in the cognition of the viewer, of the audience, and, it's, and, and you need to take them somewhere. <laughs> And into spaces, because uh, we exist in space. I mean, it, this is crucial to filmmaking. And in fact, that's one of the things that gets sacrificed a lot is actually the sense of space, because everything's become so kinetic. But you know, these details are really important in the telling of a story, in storytelling. But it's, it doesn't need to be a grand ending. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.